everyone. Thank you. Um, so we're being very literal with our title here, and we're going to talk to you about Legos. Um, so uh, Matt and I were both on the developer happiness team at Airbnb, and mostly this meant that we built tools for other developers. But um, also part of our job was organizing the Airbnb hackathons, which were collaborative across designers, engineers, uh, product managers, and user researchers. Um, and for this particular hackathon, we wanted to build a Lego mural. Um, so this is a picture of a Lego store. Um, if you've been to a Lego store, you'll see that at the back there's a wall called the Pick a Brick Wall, where you can handpick bricks of lots of different colors and sizes. And we thought it would be awesome to be able to make a mural out of these Legos. But because we're programmers, the first step in building a Lego mural is to write a tool that would help us build this Lego mural. So specifically, we wanted to build an in-browser app that would let you upload a design of the mural and give you a shopping list of what kind of and how many Legos you would need to buy and an instruction manual for how you would put the mural together. Um, and it's already live, so you can see it at sailorhg.github.io slash legoizer. Cool. Uh, so before we get started, oh, is this on? Uh, yes, OK. Uh, so before we get started, let's talk about uh, some of the build tools that we used uh, to build tools to build Lego walls. Um, so we used uh, Gulp, uh, which is a, uh, raise your hand if you've used Gulp. Cool, all right, a lot of you. Uh, streaming build tool. Uh, streaming build tool. Um, and uh, basically, it loops over all your files, uh, does various operations to them, and transforms them into output files. Uh, we also used Browserify. Uh, and raise your hand, show of hands, Browserify. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, let's use the uh, CommonJS uh, uh, module format uh, that Node uses, which allows us to use a lot of Node modules. So here's a quick screenshot of our package.json. Uh, you might wonder, like, oh, well, why do you need all these libraries? Like, you're building a Lego mural tool. Uh, are there really that many uh, tools that that are dedicated to uh, Lego utilities. Um, and there aren't, there are not. Um, but uh, the interesting thing is that a 24-bit image, which is basically any image that you're going to see on the web today, uh, I don't think anyone's really using like 8-bit images anymore, uh, has about 16 million colors. And there are about 23 available Lego colors. Uh, there, there are really more, but um, they're in weird, like, partially transparent, or they only come in certain sizes. Uh, so there are really only 23 that you can actually use. Um, and so what that means is uh, we have to do a bunch of transformations. Uh, and so let's talk about color spaces for a second. Uh, so what's a color space? So when you think about RGB values, um, they have three different channels, the R, the G, and the B channel. Uh, and you can think of those as like coordinates in a coordinate space. Um, so let's say we've got uh, you know, 12, 13, and 80 uh, for our RGB value. Uh, you can think of that as like a location. Um, and if you do that, you can sort of see how you can figure out, oh, well, if I have this location in this coordinate space uh, and I have these available locations, what's the closest available one using some sort of distance formula? Uh, and that's how, you could, that's how you could figure out, oh, well, if I have an RGB color that doesn't exist, uh, as a Lego color, that's how maybe you could start figuring out. But there's kind of a problem with that, uh, which is the RGB color space isn't perceptually uniform. And what perceptually uniform means is that when you change one value, it looks the same uh, by like, say, 10, 10, whatever your unit is, uh, that it would look the same as if you changed some other value in the channel. Uh, like, let's say you changed red by 10, it would look as different from your original color as if you changed green by 10. And that's not true of RGB. RGB is just really convenient for computers. Uh, it was not built as a perceptually uniform color space. Luckily, there is a color space that tries to be perceptually uniform. It's the CIE lab color space. Uh, it's not necessarily completely perceptually uniform, they've revised it several times, so that tells you that the first time they didn't get it right. Uh, but it's, it's much better than RGB. Um, 
And you can see kind of a diagram goes from like dark to white, uh, green to red, yellow to blue. And generally when you'll change the red green or the yellow blue or the light to dark, uh, however much you change uh, one of those channels, it's as different from your original color as if you change some other channel by the same amount. Uh, luckily, we didn't actually have to program any of that. Uh, we just used this tool called color diff, uh, thanks to being able to use the uh, node modules from Browserify. And what color diff does is we define this palette of available LEGO colors. Uh, in, in RGB, and it's pretty easy to find out what the RGB values of LEGO colors are. Uh, they're just on the internet. And what this module does is it converts from RGB to CIE. Uh, it diffs all the colors against the palette, uh, finds the closest color in the palette, converts it back to RGB, and returns it. So we really didn't have to do a whole lot. We just ran it on every single fragment pixel. Or that's what we were hoping. But it's a little more complicated. Oh, oh right. Um, so now it's probably worthwhile for us to take a brief foray into coordinate spaces and um, explain to you what we meant by running it on every fragment versus on every pixel. So one of the interesting challenges of building a tool to help us make a Lego mural is that Lego pixels don't match up with computer pixels. They are not square. If you've seen a one by one Lego brick, um, you'll notice that it's taller than it is wide. Specifically, it has a width to height ratio of five to six. So when we're building up an internal model of what our Lego mural will look like, to determine the color of each Lego pixel, we have to take a weighted sample of up to three computer pixels, as shown in this diagram. And when we're displaying a preview of the Lego mural, to the user, the unit of drawing is five computer pixels wide and six computer pixels high. Um, and here's a quick look at the code that transforms an image from computer pixel space to Lego pixel space by sampling up to three computer pixels for each Lego pixel. And that would have been where we could have stopped, uh, but it turns out that you know, 200 by 200 pixel image uh, that's about 40,000, or that is exactly 40,000 uh, things that you have to run over. And it's JavaScript, and so it's slow, and then the CIE conversion like generated a bunch of objects, uh, and it crashed our browsers. Uh, but luckily, we can uh, keep the queen's advice in mind and reduce allocations and constraint input. Uh, so what do we mean by reduce allocations and constraint input? Uh, so reducing allocations, um, if we were converting if we, if we sort of did the naive approach where we took an RGB pixel, uh, converted it to a CIE pixel, uh, converted it back to an RGB pixel, and then created a new object that was sort of like mapped out using some sort of mapper function, um, that's a lot of objects that are getting created. Instead of creating all of those objects and then having to garbage collect all of them, uh, we could just have one object and essentially destructively mutate or just overwrite the fields uh, in that one object. Uh, and that would save us about uh, 40,000 allocations per object that we managed to do that on. Uh, so that's what, that's what we did. Uh, in terms of constraining input, um, you know, if somebody is dragging like their desktop image background, which is maybe like 2,500 pixels by 25, or 25,000 pixels by 25,000 pixels, uh, that's going to be huge. Uh, the other thing is that Legos are a lot bigger than pixels. Um, Legos are way bigger than pixels. They're like hundreds of times bigger than pixels. Uh, so that would be like, like a massive monument of a mural. Um, you couldn't build it yourself. Uh, so we ended up constraining the input to uh, 200 pixels by 200 pixels. Um, so the biggest uh, dimension that anything could be is 200 pixels, uh, whether it's tall or wide. Um, and that gives you about a five foot mural uh, in either direction. We could have done more or less if we just picked it arbitrarily. Uh, well, we didn't totally pick it arbitrarily. We picked it because we only had a certain budget for building our mural, and that was about how much Lego we could afford. Uh, <laughs> and um, that's, that's all pretty nice, but it's still kind of slow. And if you're doing all of this stuff on, in, in a, just a regular JavaScript script tag, um, 
it's going to block the main thread. So you won't be able to scroll. Like Your browser will start maybe like spinning or something while this is getting calculated. So we had to do a little bit more. Um, and this, this dubious looking uh, artistic drawing uh, is what we did. Um, so we used web workers. Uh, specifically, we had one main thread, uh, which is just the sort of regular JavaScript that's running in the script tag. Uh, and the main thread spawned a second worker thread that's just always there in the background. And on the drop event, which basically you drag and drop images, it generates this drop event uh, in the DOM. On the drop event, we parse the image that just got dragged out. We create uh, an image from the data URL. Uh, throw it onto a blocking queue, which basically, it doesn't really matter how we implemented the blocking queue, it just means that only one thing is gonna get process processed at a time, uh, even if a bunch of things are in the queue. Uh, we pop one thing off the queue, or we try to, because maybe we can't, because it's blocking, uh, and use the post message API uh, in browsers to send a message with the new bitmap data over to the worker thread. The worker thread uh, runs the algorithm. It's basically everything that we were doing uh, previously. Uh, once it's done calculating, it uses post message to send the message back to the main thread. The main thread does the rendering uh, and then generates the Lego mural. Uh, you might think that's really hard or annoying to refactor, uh, but it turns out uh, if you use Brazerify and Gulp with web workers, it's actually really, really easy. Uh, and so web workers are a little annoying. That it's not like you can just share normal code that you had in the script tag. You have to have literally a separate file that gets downloaded. Um, but if you use Browserify, you can just essentially have two different index.js's, or a worker.js and an index.js. And they each just require the same modules if they're using the same code. Uh, and then if you're using Gulp or some sort of build tool, that'll make sure that all that code is in sync when you change it. It gets changed in both <coughs> packages. Um, the one thing you do have to watch out for is hidden state. So let's say you had a module that expected that it was a singleton. It was only instantiated once, or it was only called once, or what have you. Uh, since threads don't share memory in JavaScript, uh, you would have to somehow figure out how to not instantiate it twice, if it really needs to not be instantiated twice. Uh, and now we can show you a live demo of this working in action. Um, so uh, first we'll show you how the app can work to transform famous works of art into Lego murals, and then we'll show you that the Lego mural that we actually built during the hackathon. Um, so we'll take this um, oh, photo of Van Gogh irises and show you how that looks as a Lego mural. Oh. Um, sorry, I guess I should be mirroring displays. Uh, <laughs> oh no. Yeah, you may have to reload it. Chrome has a funny bug when resolutions change. Okay. There you go, yeah. Got it. Um, so we're just dragging the, Lego the Van Gogh irises image onto <coughs> our app, and it ends up looking like this. Oops. And this is Starry Night, Lego of um, And oh, so it gives you a shopping list and shows you all the single, all the colors and types of bricks that you would need to buy. So you would need to buy 1,600 um, one by two blue bricks. Um. <laughs> And then um, it also tells you about how wide and tall this is going to be. So this is going to be five feet, three inches wide, and three feet, one, inches, uh, one inch tall. And um, these are the instructions. So 
um, give me instructions for line number five. Um, and it shows you the, the instructions for the bricks that you should be using. Okay, so finally, um, this last image is um, designed by one of our Airbnb designers um, based on one of the Airbnb core values. She made calligraphy out of it, and this is the um, mural that we actually built. Embrace the adventure. Um, so using this shopping list, we went to the Lego store um, and So this is a higher res version of the original image. Um, so we bought all of these Legos and got to work building this Lego mural. Um, so these were the first few rows. Um, we kept at it, and we could start seeing images and letters, which was really exciting, um, and kept adding rows. This was it almost finished, and here is the final product. So that's our talk, and we hope that it has inspired you to embrace the adventure of using JavaScript to build physical art. Thank you.